Hey everyone, welcome to an episode of Real Wealth uh, Podcast and YouTube show. So I'm Stefan Angelini, your host from Angel Advisory. We're talking about commercial property today. So commercial property has been probably one of the most hot topics, I would say, over the last three years. And the reason being is everyone's running towards the asset class, but also there's been amazing returns in the space. So I guess there's a lot more conversations around it. And here to talk about it with me, I've got the lovely Guy Nacelle. How you going, mate? Yeah, very well, Stefan. Thanks for having me. Good. Well, mate, world, so a world of experience in the commercial space, but rather than me talk about it, could you tell us about sort of what's your experience in the commercial space and what do you do now? Yeah, absolutely. So I've come from a background in construction originally. Uh, building engineering uh, was, was the uh, education that I got. Uh, from there, got into residential um, real estate. So I got to appreciate what it's like to knock on residential doors and, and sell residential uh, over a weekend. So certainly some of the intricacies of that. Uh, but of recent times and over the last probably 15 years, it's been commercial real estate. Um, over the last probably 10 or so years, I worked from one of the largest agencies and figured um, no better time to start your own agency than, uh, uh, than three years ago, just, just before COVID. And, and then that's when NSL Property Group was born. So uh, yeah, it's been a great journey. Especially when it's become so hot. And it has. Uh, I think about my first, I, I would say my preferred property asset class is commercial. And I love it because there's no headaches and income's good. And you re, I've realised is that while capital growth is amazing, I really like income for coming through the door. It just makes you feel better. My first experience with uh, commercial investing was actually I bought a property in my self-managed super fund and it was a factory awesome. and it was out in Mill Park. And this was when you could first use borrowing in your super fund when the big banks were doing it and... It was a great investment because we could just buy it and we didn't have to do anything until we sold it. How good is that? And I guess that's been a lot of the, the appeal to people is that if you buy a commercial property, part of the lease is the tenant basically does everything, right? Spot on. Yeah, so that's one of the, one of the real benefits that we're seeing, um, especially, and we'll probably touch the, on this later, but you know, coming from a residential background, tenants pay for everything. It is a net lease. So when we say you collect your rent, but on top of that, there's the outgoing. So your water rates, insurance, uh, body corporate, if there is, uh, they're part of the outgoings. So um, it really is a, a net plus outgoings lease, which for many landlords, it's a set and forget investment, which is what you're talking about. So if you look at a, owning commercial property versus owning a resi property, residential property, you collect, let's say you earn, you, it's worth a million dollars, you collect 50 grand a year in rent, yep. then you've got property management fees, water fees, council rates, land taxes, maintenance, whatever else comes onto it. But it's a lot simpler on the commercial side. So what are some of the outgoings that are normally on the commercial side? Yeah, so certainly, so some of the things we just spoke about, so uh, outgoings are, or, or your statutory charges, so yeah. your council rates, water rates, insurance, um, uh, if there is body corporate, then that's certainly part of it. Uh, in many instances, especially around the city fringe locations, there's a car parking levy that the councils yeah. impose. So that, again, is paid by the tenant. Uh, the difference with the residential is that, on a, you know, if you're looking at an example of 50, uh, 50K per year, the landlord has to foot the bills of all those costs, whereas under a commercial lease, it's 50 plus all those costs. So um, your, your, your net position or your, your gross position is certainly a lot better. So most yeah. of the time you get that 50 grand without anything else taken Clear. off it. Whereas Absolutely. in the resi space, a lot of other things come off it. Yeah, you get, you get your transaction summary and it's less, 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 less. So Yeah, and you look at when, like when you sell a residential property, like a lot of people have done really well investing in residential property because capital growth over time has been larger because of, well, more people buy houses. Yep. There's more people out there that want to buy it. People that own commercial properties might be larger families, business owners, those kinds of things because, well, the tenant needs to be normally a business. Absolutely. Right? So it's harder to fill that as opposed to just a general person moving in. Yeah, the, the criteria to get into commercial property is somewhat a little bit more challenging and that's why a lot of people gravitate towards residential. Mm. We often say that the, the residential uh, sector is uh, a lot sexier than commercial but certainly once you're in it, uh, we get a lot of investors that make the transition back to commercial um, for simply those reasons. So um, probably a little harder to get in, but once you're in, um, you really enjoy the benefits of it. Yeah, and just recently, there's been pretty big changes into the Residential Tenancies Act. So Spot now on. there's no, you no longer have a rental renter. You've got a, you're a, you're a rental provider. Um, <laughs> and that means like, so the tenant's got a lot more say, which yeah. is very different from investing in commercial because it is normally a set and forget. You've got a lease, right? So it's a legal document that says, this is what you do. This is what I do. 
Is that sort of the best way to explain the difference in the kind of tenants and how the agreement is? Spot on, yeah. It's a good good analogy. I mean, the name says it all. It's a Residential Tenancy Act. Yeah. So it, it's there to favour the tenants. Um, so the uh, you know, some of the, the privileges that a landlord had um, are being taken away. So... Uh, for many people, it's it's too onerous, and they say, you know, let's just uh, let's deviate and, and move to another sector, and that's why commercial has been so popular. Um, when you look at normal residential, when you lease out a lease out a residential property, you normally take a one year one year lease for a tenant, and then you can go back and renegotiate that rent when that year is up. Yep. They can decide to leave, to stay, stay on, go to go on a month to month. Commercial is a bit different. Yeah, certainly. So one of the um, one of the, the benefits of a commercial lease is the tenure. So in many instances, uh, many of the businesses, if they're going to set up, 12 months is a fairly short term. By mm. the time you invest capital, um, you, you put works into a building. So many of the leases we see are three years and above. Mm-hmm. It's not uncommon to see some large organisations, five by five by five, um, some 10-year leases. What that means is that you've got a sticky tenant. Um, and as a landlord, that's perfect. You, you don't have to go through the process of re-advertising, looking for tenants, screening, um, which, you know, that in itself can be a, a bit of a challenge for, for many landlords. So certainly the ability to find a good long-term tenant is one mm. of the attractive parts of, of commercial uh, investing. And this is something that I do get confused about. It's So you can have multiple different tenant, like, so length of tenancies. So you've got a five by five by five. So you've got... Fixed, a fixed term of five years. Yep. At that five years, is there is that a renegotiation period, or what does that mean at that next time at that, that comes up? Point? Yeah, so you get the benefits of, of, uh, of increases twofold. So under a five-year lease, to use an example, there'll be incremental increases along the way. So um, it could be CPI, or it could be a fixed increase of three or four percent, mm. which is calculated annually for that first five years. At the end of the five years. If the tenant chooses to take on that next option of another five years, then the landlord has the option of a market review. So they basically go out to market, see what the rents are doing in, the, in an immediate precinct, and, um, and between negotiation, that's what gets adopted. So not only are you getting the little, little increases along the way every year, but certainly at the end of that five-year term, you've got the benefit of a, a real jump, especially if the market's flying like it is at the moment. So it's a, what we call a win-win situation. Then you've got different lengths depending on the kind of asset. Now, I've got, I've got factories that are at a five-year lease, a uh, disability centre at a 10-year lease, and I'm building a special purpose uh, childcare centre. We've got a 25-year lease. And I guess so. the reason for that is because when you're purpose building an asset, there's not as many tenants that can come in. So you sort of need to lock in that tenant. And that's from the, from the owner's perspective. You want to make sure you've got security of the income coming through the door for a long period of time. And that's where if you look to, depending on the kind of purchaser that's going to come into the asset at the end of it, a lot of people prefer that longer term lease than the shorter one because I mean, you don't know what's going to happen in five years. That's right. But it goes both ways, Stefan. So in many instances, we get tenants that say, listen, guy, I'm not interested in the short term. We're going to pump a lot of money into this business, infrastructure, building a database, mm. business, um, a business case around a, a certain asset whether it's childcare or any other, even industrial. Um, so the last thing that a, a tenant wants to do is pick up and move. Mm. Um, certainly if you're dipping your toe in the water, then and the size of the asset dictates this a lot, um, smaller assets probably a shorter term lease, but we've seen many um, real you know, sticky tenants that want to stay there for five and 10 years plus. And, and as a landlord, that's just a bonus uh, because it really is, becomes a set and forget investment, which is what we're all after. Yeah, and let's let's look back on the last few years, right? So this is 2022, 2023, where people might be listening to this. It's been a stellar time, both in residential, um, but probably more, it's more impactful in commercial. We've seen sort of cap rates get get squashed. It means the value of the property goes up when you're selling it. Yep. I, I would say the main reason behind that is the Reserve Bank cutting interest rates, uh, becoming a more appealing, it's a more appealing asset when you've got long-term income stream backed by a property a lot of families like that is that what you've been seeing why have people been running towards commercial so why has there been such an appreciation yeah so i think and it's a a traditional asset class that's probably been undervalued i think is the best way to describe it Um, but it's become now more affordable so i mean i'll give you an example so we're as a company involved in a lot of um, multi-unit estates uh, warehouses that start from 600 650 uh, offices that you can purchase from 350 
there is not much residential now that you can buy that gets you a 5% yield at that level. Mm. Um, so certainly it's been an education process, but you're right, the government has identified as commercial as a, as a real big sector, and it's one that they've really pushed hard, and, and certainly the interest rates uh, being uh, reduced has, has led to that. Um, but it's become a more educated, people as, as a public sector, we're, we're becoming more educated in that asset class. Mm -hmm. um, traditionally residential um, is subject to probably more ebbs and flows, as we're seeing now. You know, obviously we're coming off the back of an election. Uh, if the market starts to, uh, tightening, then probably the residential market feels it first. Mm. Um, the commercial market is less likely to, to get the, 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 the really significant peaks but likely it's not, not likely to drop as quick. So it's a bit steady as she goes. Uh, and certainly for a lot of landlords, if they're playing the long game, then that's perfect as well. So it's a, it's a real combination of factors. And the way I see it is the typical owner of a commercial site, generally people that like to have lower debt levels because one, banks won't give you as much money when you, most of the time when you're borrowing for a commercial property. Uh, therefore, you need more cash. More cash in it means you can afford an impact on the market if that happens, therefore you're less likely to sell if things do happen. Yep. Um, but I'll just want to focus on really probably one asset class that's sort of just shun big time in the commercial space. And when you look at different kinds of assets within the commercial space for people that don't know, I mean, you've got, you've got offices, you've got um, special assets or specialist assets, you could go to industrial and factories, for example. That has just shun brighter than any other light in the space, hasn't it's it? It's the golden child. <laughs> and like, if you look around the world, there's been a real shift towards online. COVID exacerbated that. COVID just made it happen really fast because everyone started ordering online, which means e-commerce was a big push. So people needed space to store things. But only that, food producers. Food producers need big warehouses. What, have you, what, are, you, what are you seeing as being the main drive towards this warehouse factory time the work going on absolutely yeah so it is the, it really is the the poster boy of of, uh, of commercial at the moment uh, mm -hmm. if you own a, a warehouse uh, the vacancy levels it's it's at an all all time low um but yeah just to touch on some of the asset other asset classes so offices are feeling the pinch you know, gone are the need for um for people to work in major offices so um, one thing that COVID did teach us was the ability to rediscover our neighborhoods so people are gravitating back to their to the neighbor, uh, neighborhoods and, and what's around there. Uh, retail, so the retail strips um, are probably another one that's probably undergoing a bit of change uh, where, whereby, and to answer your question, nowadays so many businesses have thought, okay, with less passing traffic and less people out on the roads, let's be creative. So they've invested in some really terrific um, online porters, whether it's a website, you know, a podcast, which is what we're doing at the moment. So they've become sophisticated in getting a product out. They realise that they still need a warehouse, even if it's in the back streets, to get their product out. So gone are the days where you need that main road frontage. You know, they're investing the money that they would otherwise have on a shopping strip towards um, a, a really clever website, uh, driving more traffic through the social platforms, whether it's Insta, uh, LinkedIn, uh, all of that. You're spending money on Google AdWords, but the product still needs to go out. So. Uh, to describe industrial, is it's the perfect storm. We had developers um, developing less during COVID because mm. of the uncertainty, especially two, three years ago. So with that created pent up demand. Uh, so the few warehouses that were available for sale or for lease, if you wanted to get in there, you had to pay. Mm. Um, but also people see it as a, as a safe bet. Um, it's literally, and to use an analogy, it's four walls, a little office and a roller door. And Many of the, the clients that we deal with said, look, if I can store the stock, I can sell it. So that's why it's become so popular. And it's also an education piece, which is what we were talking about before. Uh, gone are the days that people thought it was unsexy to have a warehouse. Now, um, some, of these, some of these places have amenities no different to a, an office complex. There's some tr amazing um, gyms that operate within industrial complexes, mm. uh, cafes, um, we, we hear of some that are having um, uh, childcare and, and um, uh, you know, other amenities. So all that becomes almost a mini mini community within a, an industrial uh, within an industrial hub. So it's really become a lot more sophisticated than it was probably 10, 15 years ago. Yeah, and just so many people still needing access to more space and more warehousing. You said there's not many tenant, there's not many available spaces. I mean, we invest into some 
some larger funds for our clients that don't want to own assets directly. So, you know, they've got an, an industrial fund, for example, yep. weighted average lease expiry of 13 years. So the average lease they have within their portfolio is 13 years. Huge. It's 100%, it's, it's, there's 0% vacancy. Yep. So it's, it's fully let That's as right. well. And then you've got rental increases in there that sort of add to it. Um, and I guess, so what we do from an, from an economic perspective for our clients, we sort of assess, all right, well, so what's happening in the commercial market now? What's happening with, with interest rates um, and what sort of a uh, what sort of a discount do you need to apply in order to 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 see where commercial markets are going? Spot on. So if we look at a, the, like a risk free government bond is trading at around about four percent at the moment. Still, you're seeing properties sell at a four percent cap rate. Now, at, as an example, if you look at to explain a cap rate, if you sell a property for a million dollars and you're getting rent at four percent, yep, or forty thousand dollars, that's a four percent cap rate. Am I right? Spot on. All right. So. If you're getting a risk-free government bond, but then you're selling property still at 4%, you've got an underlying asset there. Now, historically, commercial properties have added on a, a 2 to 3% sort of buffer to, on top of the risk-free government bond rate, right? True. But it, it, there's more than that when it comes to valuing a commercial property because it's dependent on the underlying lease. So we're seeing a lot of these cap rates getting getting stretched a little bit and moving out from Certainly. four to six percent it's starting to happen in the market um, the industrial space is a really really interesting one because I mean you've got rent reviews yep and when you've got low vacancy rents will most likely go up it does and then what happens when rents go up your cap rate goes up that's right so so you can still make money and there's I guess there's a lot of people out there that are still bullish that even though there's talks of recession, and cap rates getting pushed out and less less valuable properties. It's a really interesting one with this kind this asset class because there's rent increases, especially if you've got a lease that's linked to CPI. Well at the moment, yeah, CPI is flying. So and you're right. So those couple of mechanisms that you just spoke about um, even if you're not getting the capital growth in, in, in an idle uh, warehouse or, or, or facility, um, you're picking up those increases purely just by rental growth. Mm. Um, it's not uncommon you know, if, if the rents, especially if you're on a shorter term lease, where you can have a couple of market reviews, all of a sudden the building hasn't changed, but that rent that you started off as initially X is now Y. So people have made money just purely over a couple of years on that rental return. And if they did decide to sell, then certainly that's a big factor in, um, in, in getting, getting that extra uh, income and, well, a and benefit. Lot, and that means a lot of people, because of these rent reviews, a client of mine renting a warehouse, paying $150,000 in rent, Landlords come to him at the rent review and said it's going to 220. So he goes, well, I'm not going to pay this anymore. I'll just go out and try and buy my own factory, which brings more demand into the space. And hopefully, I guess more people want that kind of an asset. Spot them. That's a really interesting time. But we've spoken a lot about sort of education and about different asset classes and what's happening. But I guess as an important one for people that that may have commercial properties and that may believe in the space or want to get out, um, you've written a book. Yeah, and spot it, on. And it's a free PDF on things to think about. What, what is it when you're selling commercial properties? Yeah, we call it a strategic, st strategic selling, which is essentially how to maximise the, the price of your commercial property when you're selling. Um, the reality is, from a coming from a residential background, if you owned a residential property, there is so much literature out there on, on how to get the best property, f uh, the best price for your residential asset, whether it's brewing coffee during an open for inspection or baking bread or you know, the whole marketing piece. In commercial, there was actually a gap um, in the in in the system where there was no one document or one easy to read guide for owners on how to maximise their price. So, yeah, it's been a labour of love, but we've put together a book um, that's available free uh, as an ebook uh, for, for anyone that's interested. So, so if spot you could on. give us three three top tips. Yep. What's in the book? Give us three. Um, when you purchase, think of the end at that time. So, yep. what's the flexibility with the property? Uh, a lot of people get locked into an asset that has limited flexibility. So can it be developed? Can I get plans and permits? Uh, do I have the ability to um, lease it out to a multitude of different tenants? So flexibility is the key. Uh, location, um, certainly purely by supply and demand. If you're buying further out, then you've got more competition. Anything city fringe lends itself to a higher return. Mm -hmm. um, but then also looking at the zoning, a lot of commercial properties may sit on an industrial three zone or could be mixed use which then allows you to then have that upside if you do decide to develop so um, 
we talk about having the end in mind when you're purchasing. So uh, I think the, the same rings true. But there's also some little nuts and bolts that you can think about in terms of marketing. You know, do you go expression of interest versus auction? Uh, is a private sale the best method? Best method. So there are a couple of different systems in place that may be better suited to one asset class versus another. So um, yeah, we've summarised it into a, um, uh, one easy to read book and yeah, it's available for anyone that's uh, interested. So spot on. Cool. Well, I'll leave it there. So if anyone wants access to it, feel free to reach out to hello at angeladvisory.com.au and I'll flick them a copy of your book. Perfect. Now, mate, it's been a really great chat. Before we sign off, I need to do a general disclaimer is any information you've heard in this in this podcast or chat is just general information. Please don't consider it as personal advice. If you're seeking personal advice, go speak to your licensed financial planner, financial advisor. So always got to end it with that. Uh, mate, thank you so much for your time. World, world of knowledge. Um, we're looking forward to catching up soon. Good on Thanks, Steph. Thanks for having me on. Cheers. Good.